All right, folks, welcome to week 11, I think it is. Um, good news is after I reviewed the course outline, I discovered that one of the topics for today was not on the course outline. There's no point torturing you guys with it. Uh, I might do it as a value add at the end. So today's lecture will actually be pretty short. So that'll be nice for uh, everybody's uh, mental well-being. And I misplaced my marker. Please have me put it back here. Nope. How do I lose a marker in like 30 seconds? Seriously? Hey? Oh, no. I literally had it in my hand. I did something with it, and now it's gone. Well then, that's making things a little slower than expected. What the hell? Um. That's why I like following a routine because I don't lose my marker. There we go. It was under my shit. All right. Uh, so today we're talking about set operations. Uh, some of you, has, most of you have probably seen Venn diagrams at one point in your life. Um, usually often used for memes. Uh, they actually do come from, you know, math, just so you know. Um, so specifically, we're going to be talking about um, the three set operations that are that SQL provides. Um, so essentially what set operations are is you have one or more collections of data and you want to perform an operation that lets you um, merge them, exclude them, or find what matches between them. Normally with this, you do two queries. So the first one that most people support um, is the union operator. Basically, union says it's going to take, it's going to give you everything from set A and B. Now, there's two modes to run it, where it says it gives you everything from A plus anything in B that's not in A. So, basically, it gives you one of everything. Or there's the union all, which just gives you everything, including duplicates. That's the first one. The second one is the intersect. So if we've got set A and set B, it's what exists in both. And then our last one is, in mathematical terms, it's actually called the complement. And I know I misspelled it, but that's okay. The complement. So if you're taking high school math, you learned about the complements of a set. Um, in database land, it's known as accept, or if you're Oracle, it's known as minus. Um, essentially what it does, it gives you everything in A that is not in B. So it's gonna exclude that tiny little slice here. So we have three set operations. Um, I set up a fresh database just for this. Literally, I generated it earlier today. Uh, so it's completely new. Um, the premise behind the database I gave you guys is there's a list of clients and then there's a booth. Um, has anybody here ever been to a trade show of some sort? Normally, when you go to a trade show, or even if you're going to like to an expo, sometimes you get a little card. And if you're interested in the products that they're selling at a given booth, you can swipe your card or tap your card or whatever. And it tracks, it adds you to a list of clients that visited that booth of the day that's interested in your product. So the premise is I have a list of clients and I have a list of visitors at a booth. Just so you have the, the general mental picture of what this data is. Mind you, it's a very small list because I didn't need more than a couple hundred records to show this how this works. Um, 
So without further ado, I'm going to show you guys how this stuff works. And I'll also cover some of the gotchas that people don't realize with uh, set operations. Okay, so I already talked about that. So the way it works in SQL is So, so far we have two different select statements. So I can run query one, great. There it goes. Then I'll run query two, also good. So I'm running two operations. However, let's say I want to know all the uniques. So there might be a case where you have people visiting your booth that aren't your existing clients. So sometimes you want to target them specifically, or maybe you want to send out a mailer to everybody, whether it's your client or the people that visited. Um, and has anybody in here ever been involved in an email campaign? Anybody ever read, read all the fun laws tied to email campaigns? Uh, mostly thanks to Europe now, which is good for us, but Europe has some really brutal laws when it comes to email campaigns. And California's following, so, you know, good for everybody, actually. Um, so let's just say I want the list of all the clients. I take query one and I do union query two. So that will give me everything from clients plus anything from the booth visits that's not in this set. So I do this set, cool. I do this set, also cool. If I run both sets, so actually, hang on. That one was 63 rows and this one's 200. So we have a total. 263 rows that we're playing with. Um, and I'm going to run my union. How many rows do we have? 240. Because we have 23 rows in the booth visits of clients that already exist. So it gave me everybody from clients plus any new and unique visitors from booth visits. Now, by the way, anybody who's brought in this database will not have the exact same data as me because it randomly picks 23. So every database is unique after you run the import script for this. Every database will be different from each other. Magic. Uh, I literally do a random selection of 23 and insert them as part of the build routine. So if you notice that some of your stuff doesn't match, that's why. Okay. So the other operator we have that's a un we have union all. Which kind of a, I've never really point of union all, but let me just run it anyways. And we have 263 rows. What union all does is it ex includes non unique rows. So you get duplicated rows. So it gives you everything from A, everything from B, but it includes literally everything from B, even if they're already in set A. Um, not the union is what is used. In other words, you want everything from the first query plus anything from the second query that's not in the first query. All right, so that's the first thing. Now, the next thing that you guys have to learn about is the two queries have to be the same. Not the same in the sense that you have to pull the same fields. However, uh, let me try to run this and you'll, we'll see our error message. The use select statements have a different number of columns. The problem is that we have two sets and they're not similar structured sets. So the first one has three columns, the second one has two. You can't compare three to two. <clears throat> because that's just not how it works. Okay, so when you're working with set operations, you have to have the same number of columns. Um, unfortunately, I didn't prepare this data set quite 
as well as I should have. The other thing that you have to be careful of is the columns are supposed to be the same data type. So if this is a, an in, a var car and this one is an integer, the other one has to be a var car and an integer in the same places. Again, you can't compare A to 6. A is a letter, 6 is a number. And even if you had the string 6, as far as the database is concerned, you guys have learned about if statements by now. String six is not equal to six. So a lot of database servers will be forgiving and go, oh, you're just an idiot. We'll just take, we'll treat it as a, as a number anyways. But you should not make the assumption the database server is going to be nice and do it for you. It might decide to go the other way and convert your numbers to strings instead. So rule one of doing a union, same number of columns. Rule number two of doing, well, not just unions, any set operation is the columns have to have matching data types. The next thing uh, that you have to be aware of with unions is, or a set operations is the more columns you have, the more variance there is, and then you're going to have less and less matches. So for example, I'm going to add the primary key to this, which is going to be really dumb because the primary keys are going to be unique. Yeah. Yeah, the union all will, will end up with duplicates. All right, so I'm going to add the primary keys to this. And now we are going to have 263 rows. Why? Because I added enough additional data in each set that suddenly the sets were totally invalid because, you know, if we're just trying to find the unique email addresses between both sets, why would you include the ID? So the fewer columns you have in a union, the better. Same thing will apply to accept or intersect. The fewer you have, the better, because that way you'll end up with a cleaner output. Because again, if I'm comparing three columns of data and one of those columns is always different, you're defeating the point of the union or the, the intersect or the accept. I want to leave the valid queries and for your, for your examples. Okay. Now let's go say, let's take a look at intersect, which is the second one I did. So intersect is give me the val give me rows of data that exist in both and only those ones. Exclude anything from A and B that aren't in both sets. So in the example of our booths, these are our very loyal customers. They've given us money and they came to see us at the trade show. Maybe we should run a promotion just for them. Giving them, you know, an extra 5% off their next purchase kind of thing. So and this is how simple this gets. You take this query, I'm going to put it in the intersect area, and I'll change it to intersect. And now if I run it, 23 rows. Remember earlier that little bit of math I said, you know, there's a total of 263 rows. Out of those, there's 240 that are unique. 263 minus 240 is at 23. So this is the list of customers that exist in both um, both lists. So in this case, we could actually run like a promotion for those 23 people that came to see us and give them like a really good discount because they went out of their way to actually, you know, meet and greet, which is always nice. And the last one is accept. And I'm going to actually do this one two different ways. OK. 
Okay, so the first one is, is all our clients that didn't come to the trade show. So we can guilt them for not coming to the trade show. Or maybe we could run a promotion saying, hey, we noticed you didn't come to the trade show. We're going to add 5% to your next one, not take off 5%. You know, they're just being silly, but you know, stuff like that. Play the D brand way of doing things. Um, alternatively, if we want to know the people that came to see us that we that never bought anything from us before, we'd actually just flip it. So give us everybody from the booth visits that are in our client list. And again, this is going to be an accept. So if I run this, we are going to have 40 rows, right? Because our math, right? There's 201, 63 in the other. If we take out the 23 from set A that already exists in B, that'll give us what's left. Sounds a lot, a lot like math, doesn't it? B minus A equals 23. Um, so if I run this list, it gives us everybody who came to the booth who hadn't bought anything from us. Again, you could run a different promotion with a different coupon code on that. And you could use your coupon codes to find out just how good your marketing is. You give everybody who came to the booth a certain percentage off. They buy stuff. They use the coupon code. Now you know how good your your turnover rate is. Um, this sounds like I'm doing a uh, lesson on marketing. Um, but this is, you know, generally what often these things are used for. Um, I've seen this used for more complex stuff where we're building up lists of features in a product where you have the base product plus any customizations they want plus any other add-ons and then at the end there's like a the accept happens at the end for things that are never allowed to see the light of day um i can explain that story when i'm not being recorded um ndas <laughs> not quite an nda but not something i should broadcast on the internet um but yeah, those are the three set operations. Um, I still need to clean up the lab, so don't panic about the next lab yet, lab eight, um, because I got to clean it up because I just didn't have a chance to clean it up yet. But lab seven is ready to go. Um, I'm hoping to clean up lab eight by tomorrow. I'm going to try to fix it when I get home. Um, I can't remember if I cleaned it up or not, so that's why I say I'm just don't panic about lab eight yet. Um, the announcement will come out. Um, now, that having been said, that's the, the pr primary topic for today. Um, what's going to happen next is, next week I'm going to talk about the final exam, because we're getting close to December, and the, final, the date has been published to access for your exam, just so you guys know. Let's see if I can remember this right. December 10th at 17.30. So that's 5.30, right? Yes, 18 is 6. So 5.30, December 10th, is the final exam for this. It is not in this classroom. Well, actually, it might be in this classroom. I didn't actually notice the room. Uh, let me go check. So much faster when I'm on the network here. For those of you that aren't sure where to see your exams, it's actually in your timetable, right at the end. No, oh no, no. Yes. They have us next to the bakers. In H102, do not come to class hungry. You will not, because the the uh, pastry students are probably doing their exams that week. And the cooking students and the restaurant international is also cooking at that time of day. You're going to come into that room and all you're going to smell is food. And wine, because the wine tasting room is right across the hall. And they're probably doing their exams too. Uh, so, oh man. It's been 18 years since I've been in that room though. So maybe it's gotten better, but I doubt it. Um, yes. Okay. So that's a pro tip. Eat before you come to class. 
Even if it's just eat an apple or cut up all granola bars or six slices of pizza, whatever it takes, just don't come to class hungry because you're not going to be able to concentrate. Um, I will make a point of highlighting that in the announcements for that test. Um, oh, man, I didn't realize it was an H102. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, okay, so yeah, so next week I am going to talk about uh, the final exam. Um, it's likely going to be on paper, just so you know. Scantron. You guys have done Scantron. So... Apparently, I wasn't allowed to do the midterm online, so, you know, that's okay. I just followed what the other teacher did before, and apparently she just ignored the chair. Um, which might explain why she's not teaching it again. I don't know. Um, so that having been said, I will be, uh, yeah, discussing it with you guys next week, comedy questions, that kind of stuff. Uh, we're almost at the end of the content, which is good. Uh, yeah. Outside of that, I'm going to wrap it up here today. It's a nice quick class today, half an hour. Because we're reaching that point of the semester where we've almost covered everything you're supposed to have with the final. Yes, you're going to have an SBA. So, you know, either the practical test, you're going to have one of those two again. Um, they'll be out of the way. It won't even be the same week as your written tests. You'll just be done. Okay. Um, if anybody has any questions about this, knock yourselves out. Here's your chance. If not, you're free to run. Going once, going twice, going three times. Oh, the topic? Common table expressions. It'll make more sense after I talk about my talk. The, there's a topic coming up called views. It'll make more sense if I talk about views before I talk about common table expressions. I will probably throw it into the last lecture as a value added. Um, I won't test people on stuff that's not in the course outline. Because that's not right. If it's not in the course outline, it should not be tested or evaluated. That's the rules. People just don't follow them. The final exam probably be on Scantron. You know, the blue sheets, fill in the bubbles, multiple guests. Yeah. Practical be on your computer. How to do a practical without your computer. So practical will be on your computer. Final exam will be on paper. Um, we're not technically not supposed to do any major evaluations um, electronically. So, well, other than an SBA, but outside of that, actual theory tests are supposed to be electronic. Okay. And 